great to be here today and Belinda of course has talked about a report on sustainability indicators for a number of tertiary campuses. I'm going to be talking about a report on sustainability indicators for Australia which has recently been completed. And I think everyone here will be aware that there's a lot of international movement away from just reporting on traditional economic indicators like GDP towards a broader sustainability set of indicators. And you know, one of the examples is the OECD Better Life Index, which looks at quality of life, material conditions, looks at a set of capitals, natural capital, human capital, economic capital, and social capital, and looks at how that series of capitals is preserved over time so we're sustainable. That's sort of the background. But the first, the first thing you've got to do if you're going to achieve sustainability is measure your performance. And that's what this project, which the Australian Government set up last year, is all about. And it established the National Sustainability Council. That's the council there. I won't go into all the people, but it's a mix of people with uh, business, academic, uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, and, and myself as chair. And essentially what we're tasked to do is to report every two years on Australia's sustainability against a set of sustainability indicators. And that's the indicators that we used. Uh, they cover social and human capital, things like skills and education and health, natural capital, climate change, atmosphere, land, water, and economic capital, wealth and income, housing, transport. And as well as that, there are a number of contextual indicators which are quite important about Australia's population, how it's changing, and our cultural diversity and our migration and the way we use land. So we were tasked with preparing this report and uh, we released the report and it's available on the web uh, now and it really, I think, is a fantastic resource. Uh, for uh, yourselves, for students, <coughs> for business. And essentially we've called it conversations with the future because we believe this is an evidence base for people like yourselves to use in discussions about the future. I think a lot of people are pretty frustrated with the very short term nature of a lot of the political debate in Australia. You know, three months seems a long time. Uh, these are issues that are 15, 20 year issues and if we're going to debate them properly we need to know what is happening. Now the council's job is to be an independent council to pull together the data and put it in a report but also to try to pick out some of the themes and issues. And so in the report we've got a bunch of chapters on key issues like education, innovation and engagement, planning for an aging population, sustainable cities, etc. And once again, if you uh, or your students are looking for information on a particular topic, this is quite a good starting point. Uh, we're not, of course, saying in any sense we've covered the field and you know, there are whole libraries written on each of these topics. The advantage of what we've done essentially is to take a bit of a helicopter view. We don't pretend to be the last word on any of these topics, but by seeing all the information together, you get that helicopter view and you can start to think about things like trade-offs. You know, if, how are we doing in health? Or how are we doing in education? Where are we putting our money? What are the alternatives? So it's really about seeing those trade-offs and comparisons. Now, where are we doing well? So from the helicopter view, and once again, if you look at the press, you think Australia's doing terribly, and we do tend to whinge a bit. But, you know, we are doing extraordinarily well in a lot of ways. I mean, we do rank number one on the OECD Better Life Index, which is a combination of our incomes, our economic prosperity, but also our quality of life. And how well that's been maintained over time. Our incomes have gone up faster than anywhere else in the developed world in the last 20 years. Our life expectancy has increased dramatically. 
people my age, in their 50s, our life expectancy has increased eight years, or seven, seven to eight years compared to my father's generation, my mother's generation. Our educational attainment, once again, you know, we often hear how poorly we're doing, but my take on the figures, having seen it, is actually there's been a huge improvement in Australia's educational attainment since the uh, late 1970s. I mean, we were well down the list of the OECD in terms of things like finishing school in the, in the 70s, and then there was a big improvement through the 80s through to now. Water use, there's been a big improvement in the last decade. Our cities are very livable. And interestingly, when you look at the, the facts, we're a very safe community where there's a lot of active social participation and volunteering. Once again, if you read the Herald Sun, you'd think we're one of the most dangerous places in the world. But when you rate us up against uh, other developed and developing countries, we're actually right at the safest end. Interestingly, there's a graph in the report that shows our perceptions of our safety are actually quite low. But our actual safety is quite good. So that's where we're doing well. Where we're not doing so well, productivity and innovation, uh, the last uh, the last eight, eight or nine years, our productivity has actually gone down. Uh, our, our business innovation is not as good as a lot of our competitive countries. <coughs> but I have to say, if there was one factor that really hit me as I saw all of this data from a helicopter view, it was the social inequality in Australia. That we do perform very well, but the gap between the, the rich and the poor in our performance is greater in Australia than in many other comparative countries. We're not doing so well in chronic illness. We're certainly living longer, but once again, people my age in their 50s are much more likely to be suffering from chronic illness than our parents' generation were. The environment, uh, and you know, I don't, don't think I'd have to tell this room that we're not uh, the best in the world in the way we manage our environment. And our carbon emissions, we're the biggest emitter of carbon per head in the developed world, and our biodiversity has been massively impacted since European settlement. And while our cities are very livable, all that sustainable, and we've got big challenges on energy consumption, car dependency, and once again, that issue of the social divide where we're seeing an increasing divide between a relatively affluent inner core of our cities and a fairly disadvantaged uh, outer edge, edge of the cities. So that's you know, just a quick snapshot of, of the, uh, <coughs> where we're doing well and where we're not doing so well. Of course, that's within Australia, but what's happening here is being very greatly impacted by world megatrends. And the CSIRO and others have identified these trends and we talk about them a bit in the report, but essentially the massive economic rebalancing towards Asia, particularly China, the domination of the people economy, more and more business is around knowledge and people, the massive growth of cities around the world, growth in our cities, very substantial, but worldwide this is having huge impacts. Environmental and resource imperatives, climate change, energy, water, uh, food, the huge challenges we're going to face in that. And all of this is within the context of being an incredibly connected world, far more so than we have ever been before. Now, I thought in the remaining time, what I'd do is just give a snapshot of a few of the issues in the report, and they illustrate some of the points I've made. This graph shows our PISA reading literacy score for 15-year-olds, uh, 2009. And what it shows is this is Australia here, China, Hong Kong, Korea, Finland, Canada. We are up in the top six or seven countries in the world in our performance, 15 year old reading. But what you'll also see is our line between the more disadvantaged areas and the more advantaged is steeper than in other, other countries. That is our 
more disadvantaged areas are performing worse comparatively than those other high performing countries. And that you know, graph is representative of many other educational indicators. If you look at year 12 completion, a range of other indicators, it shows this stark divide between the wealthier and the less wealthy areas. I talked about chronic illness, so this is obesity uh, by socioeconomic disadvantage. And in the most disadvantaged uh, quintile suburbs areas, 35%, which is just an extraordinary figure, 35% of people uh, with obesity. And of course that translates through to diabetes and numerous other health conditions. And you'll see that socioeconomic you know, divide there, the more advantaged areas, uh, significantly less uh, obesity and indeed the figures also show even for life expectancy there are differences of up to seven years between municipalities in Australia in life expectancy. Seven year difference, you know, quite extraordinary. But you know, obesity for Australia is a huge challenge going forward because it's going to have a big impact on our well-being and some people are saying you know, perhaps this will be the first time where our children are not as healthy as the parents were. In terms of the economy, we have done incredibly well. This grey line here represents the growth in our incomes from the 1960s through to the 2000s, the grey line. And you'll see that that uh, average increase in, in gross national income per capita has been between 2 and 3% throughout that time, that line here. What the boxes represent is the contribution to our income rise what's caused that. And you'll see the blue is productivity. The major, major contributor to our increasing incomes has been productivity growth. Yellow is terms of trade and orange is basically labour participation rates. Now the take out from this is obviously two things. One is productivity is incredibly important. But two, what you'll see is in the last decade where our incomes have continued to rise, a huge contributor has been that yellow, which is terms of trade. I.e. the Chinese are paying more for our goods. So our incomes go up. The problem going forward, of course, is that most people are saying that that's going to decline. Productivity has been uh, reducing. And that can only lead to one thing, and that is reducing incomes and re reduced numbers of jobs. And you know, we haven't really hit that yet, but that's the, old, the major obstacle that we face. Now, if we are going to be productive, what we need to be is innovative. And I think all the experts, and I'm certainly not one, but all the experts indicate that the next source of productivity is knowledge capital. It's doing things smarter, being innovative. Now, we've done the deregulation. This is probably where we have to go. Now, if you're going to be innovative, there's a whole lot of aspects of that, and we talk a bit about it in the report, and obviously research is part of it, research and development, but it is only part. And very importantly, other aspects of innovation are what they call knowledge assets or intangible assets are firm-specific human capital and organisational capital. Things like making your staff uh, more skilled in the job they do. Uh, put investing in your staff, investing in design, in new ways of doing things. R&D, and, that, and that's the green here, R&D, research and development, and in Australia, overall, we actually spend quite a bit on research and development, but disproportionately that's in the, in the uh, education sector rather than the business sector. Other countries spend more on R&D in the business sector. And then the, the blue here is software and databases. And this shows the United States and the other countries. But when we look at Australia, you'll see we're significantly less in our investment in knowledge assets than you know, most of these competitive countries. And so if you're going to be innovative, that is something we're going to have to turn around. It's fairly trite to say we've got an ageing population and 
I think we know that, but it's really what are we going to do about it? And this is the population in 1981 showing obviously the bulk of people below 40. And then there we are today where of course the, the shape of our population has changed and we're getting more and more people uh, over 40, indeed more and more people over 60 and over 80. And I guess there are a lot of interesting challenges associated with that. The one that's most often talked about, of course, is the health system and how will the health system manage an ageing population and how will we pay for it. But there are other really interesting issues around planning, for example. You know, where do we plan our retirements? What sort of jobs are people going to have? Are they going to work longer? Are they going to work in volunteering? How are the generations going to relate? So there's some really interesting uh, stories associated with that. Another, I think, fascinating aspect is when you step back and you look at the contribution cities make to our economy. And cities uh, are responsible for about 80% of our GDP. And this graph shows the contribution of different parts of Australia to our GDP in the 1990s and the 2000s. And the blue is Sydney and the orange is Melbourne and the yellow is Brisbane and grey is regional Queensland and that light blue is regional WA. Now, I think this is a fascinating graph because in the 1990s, Sydney was responsible for 27% of all Australia's GDP. And yet in the 2000s, that plummeted to just 15%. And you'll see Melbourne then you know, kicked on, grew to around 18%. Now, I think what that shows is two things. One, that cities are very important. But two, that nothing is fixed. That these things <coughs> change. And there's a whole lot of business and political <coughs> and cultural reasons behind that. And planning was a key factor. But if we're going to maintain prosperity and... Uh, and livability, we, we have to understand the economic importance of cities. Of course, on the sustainability side, one of our core problems with our cities is that our transport systems, and we're totally car reliant, in fact, the proportion of people driving to work has increased in the last 20 years, and the proportion of cycling or walking has decreased. So, and this just represents the time we're spending in a car traveling to and from work, it's these, these blue lines here, and you'll see that's increased in the last decade by more than half an hour a week, by about 35 minutes a week extra we're spending in the car. <coughs> Climate change, I don't need to say to this group, you know, there's Australia up there, only Brunei and the United Arab Emirates emitting more per head than Australia. But there are some good potential aspects of uh, our sustainability, and one of them does relate to water in the last decade, where in this is the volume of water used in irrigated agriculture since 2003, and that's the productivity. That, that is the production in irrigated agriculture. So in one case we've shown we can actually reduce the use of a resource and maintain our productivity. Now, the challenge now is to do that in energy and other resource uses. Food and agriculture, also a huge opportunity for Australia with food demand in Asia will double by 2050. It's a big opportunity. But this, at the same time, we've got huge sustainability challenges with soil erosion, soil acidification, and soil carbon. So for universities, our food and agriculture and soil and water uh, obviously areas of huge importance where we can help Australia's sustainability and economic future. And then the last point I want to make was about inequality and disadvantage and yes we have been very successful in increasing our incomes and our incomes have gone up uh, since uh, 1995 uh, by 57% on, on average but at the top end it's gone up 67% at the bottom end by 47%. So what we're seeing is a increasing gap. And if you look at a wealth <coughs> map, it's much, even much more dramatic than incomes, where the top uh, 
10% own an extraordinarily disproportionate amount of wealth compared to the bottom 10%. So finally, where to from here? This report obviously is not the final word, but we hope it's the start of a national conversation. And between now and the next report, we'll be talking to people around the country to get their input into the indicators and how a future report might be presented. Thank you. Thank you.